So it took me a while to figure out as a pastor um, what my mission is, but it started to solidify about 10 years ago that my mission as a pastor is for me, I want to help people fall in love with Jesus. I know how Jesus changed my life, and that's why I'm a pastor, um, and, and I want to help you fall in love. That's why I provide, not every pastor does, there's like the next steps in the worship folder, and that's why there's daily scriptures, because those are tools I can give you to help you fall in love with Jesus. My life before Jesus was, now I grew up in the church, and I've always known about God and my faith, but there was a moment where it became mine. And before Jesus, I was lonely and isolated, uh, and, and when I found Jesus, when he changed my life, I found lifelong friends. I found my mission and my purpose. And so, how has Jesus changed your life? I mean, come on, you're here for a reason. It's the middle of Sunday morning. This is your day off. This is the time to go to Giant and do your laundry before you start back up for the week, right? So why are you here? Maybe your week feels better when you start with worship. Maybe, maybe something just calls you to be here. Or life is more in tune. And so the question for each and every one of us really is to remember, how has Jesus changed your life? This isn't a teaching note on the screen because this is the ultimate question for us. This is what we're to remember and to carry with us. And if you don't have an answer this morning or you're struggling with that, pray. I'm here. I'm here all the time. <laughs> Reach out. I'd be glad to sit with you, to talk with you, to pray with you. Your community is here for you if you're struggling with that question. And yet I'm going to ask it again because it's so critical to our faith. How has Jesus changed your life? This is our Thrive sermon series, and we're talking about how to thrive in every aspect of our lives. We talked in week one about how our finances can derail our faith, that when we're overwhelmed with debt or stress and worry about our finances, how that pulls us away from God. Last week, we talked about where is your treasure what are you storing up in heaven? What do you value that's important? And today we're going to talk about how does Jesus desire us to live? Greg is going to come read for us sections, because it's a long story, sections of Acts chapter 10, the story of Peter and Cornelius. In Caesarea, there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius, who was a captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. He gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. One afternoon, about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming toward him. Cornelius, the angel said, Cornelius stared at him in terror. What is it, sir? He asked the angel. And the angel replied, Your prayers and the gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Now send some men to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He is staying with Simon, a tanner, who lives near the seashore. As soon as the angel was gone, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier, one of his personal attendants. He told them what had happened and sent them off to Joppa. The next day, as Cornelius' messengers were nearing the town, Peter went up on the roof to pray. It was about noon, and he was hungry. But while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. 
he saw the sky open and something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. In the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles, and birds. Then a voice said to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat them. No, Lord, Peter declared, I have never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. But the voice spoke again, do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. The same vision was repeated three times. Then the sheet was suddenly pulled up into heaven. They arrived in Caesarea the following day. Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered his home, Cornelius fell at his feet and worshiped him. But Peter pulled him up and said, stand up. I'm a human being just like you. So they talked together and went inside where many others were assembled. Peter told them, you know it is against our law for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you. But God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. So I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. Now tell me, why did you send for me? Cornelius replied, four days ago I was praying in my house about this same time, three o'clock in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in dazzling clothes was standing in front of me. He told me, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your gifts to the poor have been noticed by God. Now send messengers to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He is staying in the home of Simon, a tanner who lives near the seashore. So I sent for you at once, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here, waiting before God to hear the message the Lord has given you. Then Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. This is the message of the good news for the people of Israel. There is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of all. Even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. Can anyone object to their being baptized? now that they have received the Holy Spirit, just as we did. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So it's a long story, but it's very important, the story with Peter and Cornelius. And they both receive a vision at the same time. And so Cornelius, um, so you have Cornel- you have Peter, and he's one of the disciples. And yes, we've known him, he followed Jesus for three years. And you have Cornelius. Now, Cornelius was a Roman, and he comes from a wealthy, you know, he's very wealthy because it talks about his whole household. He was a pagan. He worshipped the Roman gods, which were simply idols made out of stone. And Peter, being a Jewish and faithful his whole life, keeping the kosher laws, but following Jesus, was, gets a vision as well to go when Cornelius summons him. Now this is a big deal. Uh, because, as Peter said, like this is so Peter, right? Peter gets a vision from God with all these animals coming down on a sheet, and God says, eat them. And Peter says, well, I can't do that, God. Like, you get a vision from God, and you say, no, and God says, eat, and you say, I can't do that. But it's so Peter. This is the guy who walked on water and then got afraid and started to sink. This is the guy who says to Jesus, oh, I'll never betray you, and then denies his presence three times that night. And so you saw 
what just struck me about the scripture was that God had to say three times, go and eat. And so he does. And then he goes to Cornelius' household. And that day, Cornelius and his entire household will be baptized and they will follow Jesus. And it couldn't have happened unless Peter had followed that vision, said, but I've always done it this way before, Lord. And Peter said, but God said, go. Because what was more important than the kosher laws? Reaching, it even says it in the scripture, the Gentiles with the message. God loves those outside the church. This is what Jesus is about, changing lives, offering hope, love, comfort, family, community, eternity to each and every one of us. And our mission is to want others to know of this greatest gift, that Jesus died for everyone. The entire book of Acts is really about that. It's called the sequel to Luke. It's the sequel to the Gospels because Jesus has risen and he's ascended into heaven and Acts is about how Jesus' message goes out into the world. And so here's the foundation of our faith. How has Jesus changed your life? And then, how will you share Jesus with others? Because God desires, it says it in this morning's scripture, God desires everyone's life to be changed, to live differently. And Cornelius knows something's going on, and he sends for Peter. And the two meet. And the scripture says the Holy Spirit fell upon them. And this morning, Peter's life has changed because he says, I can't go into an unclean house. I'm not allowed into your house, but God told me today that no one is unclean because Jesus' message is for everyone. And if Peter hadn't have gone... Cornelius would have missed out on the greatest gift of Jesus. You see, God uses those inside the church, us whose lives have been changed, to reach out and make a difference in others' lives. This scripture is considered a turning point in church history. From here, the gospel changes not just for Jews, but for the entire world. All because Peter heard God in a vision and lived that out. It wasn't about whether Peter could have a bacon cheeseburger or not, but rather it was about God saying Everyone is worthy of hearing my mission. No one is considered unclean. And from this moment, the gospel will expand and grow from here. Because God used Peter, and God wants to use us to help others have their lives changed. So this Thrive series has been a financial series, but it's not about just giving to the church. It's about how we live as changed people. And we started with talking about how do we live with just enough and our debt because finances are the number two reason that couples get divorced. And when surveyed, Christians say finances are also the number two reason that pushes God out of their lives because the stress and the worry and the pain and the extra hours of work. And finances 
are one way to change the world, to reach those outside. Peter never expected to go to Caesarea. Never expected to enter a Gentile's house and eat with him. Never expected to taste bacon. And yet, God acts in this moment and teaches us how great God can do. And expect God to do great things. Peter walked in there not knowing what was going to happen and saying, God told you, you saw it for me, God told me to come. So here I am in that day, an entire household was baptized. And I keep saying that because that's important. We know he had a large household. It would have been his family, his slaves, the extended family. And this is key because Peter, uh, Cornelius was wealthy and influential, and he knew other households. And we know that from here, the gospel continues to jump from one house to another until here we sit today. And so often, you know, the teaching, we don't expect God to do great things. We get caught up in the to-do lists, right, and how much where all we got to do and chauffeuring the kids everywhere. And I hear in retirement, you have even more to do. And, and we just go and, and we don't expect God. And we don't so often see God's miracles at work. That's why every week I try to tell you where God has been active in your church. Because it's important for us to remember and know that we are making a difference. That it is about lives changed. It's not just about sitting here with our favorite songs. But it's about how has Jesus changed your life? And how will you change the lives of others with Jesus? So here's what's going on right now as lives are being changed. The youth revolution and the volunteers are down in the kitchen making a meal and we're partnering with the Journey Church in Harrisburg and we will serve the homeless today. One family even had to cut their Disney vacation short because the kids were like, no, no, I can't miss that day. That's my favorite. That's lives being changed. I put out a call for turkeys and ham, and I know I messed it all up, and Glenn said to me early in the week, we got four, I've never had that many. And he said to me, he said to me when I walked down to check on the youth, and he said, please don't ask for turkeys, I got eight. I don't know what to do with them. (laughs) But he and a small group that he gets together are going to cook a meal for Daystar, Center for Spiritual Recovery, and then take people who are desperately in need and raise them up until they're ready to live on their own again from recovering from an addiction. Lives will be changed this week. I had a few others written down. Oh, the one other I wanted to share, is Wednesday night at What's Up Wednesday, we had to set up an extra table. And then they set it up just for the kids and put paper down with crayons so the kids could sit together. And they all wanted to sit together. And they colored and they sat and they ate and they want to be here. That's Jesus and you changing lives together. And you are needed. 
We believe here in what's called the biblical command of tithing. Now that's all fancy big words, right? And what it simply means is from the beginning of the scripture in an agricultural society, over and over again we learn about tithe is simply the old English or Latin word for 10%. Because God calls us in the scripture to give 10%. It's often called, here's another churchy phrase, the first fruits. Because see, especially in the Old Testament, it talks about give the first fruits because that, it was an agricultural society. And God said, give the first of the harvest, the first fruit, the first 10%, because it was easy when you're in an agricultural society. Okay, you got 10 bushels, give one bushel to God. And so we call it the tithe. And it's not about the giving, it's about uh, the, the monetary amount, it's about trusting in God, because you know, if, if, we have, if we have enough in our bank accounts, right, like, we're okay, but if, if we get it down a little bit, then the anxiousness starts, and you know, you say to your spouse, like, you need to stop. <laughs> it's about the trusting in God, and that's why God called us, calls us, and in the scriptures throughout, the first fruits, because it's about giving to God first, and then living on enough, the other 90. I love this stat. This is things they don't teach you in seminary, right? But I heard another pastor. The red letters in the Bible are are Jesus talking. You know, we make it red to make it extra holy. But the red letters, 66% of the time that you read a red letter, Jesus is talking about money, wealth, and possessions, because he's fully human, and he was a blue-collar carpenter, and he knew, and he also knows how that can pull us away. It's about trusting in God. Now, as pastor, I hear over and over again, um, well, but not everybody can tithe. You know, some people just can't, and I'm like, hmm, God told everyone to do it. And here, here's old math. And um, literally in the first service, I said this, and Thea's like, really? Here's how easy God makes it to figure out the tithe. You move a decimal point. And in the new math, she didn't learn it. She's like, oh, you can do that? I'm like, yeah, 10%. That's how it works. See how easy God makes it. And God calls each and every one of us. And I, I know this because I've seen it in my life. I was pastor at a church, and we had a very active food pantry. And we tied that ministry to our discipleship. And so we had a grandmother who was raising her four grandchildren start coming to church because she came through our food pantry. And sometimes I go and I write you notes and thank you notes, and I know that she was one of our top givers. Like, I wrote her a thank you note that year, and I was like, wow. And I know she was a top giver. She came through our food pantry. A mom of four, a grandmother of four, needing to use a food pantry, was one of our top givers because... She tithed. All she did was move the decimal point. I know this in my own life because my parents were very clear with us about our faith and as they raised us that they tithed and they gave 10%. And they always reinforced this and gave us the story because they went to church and do a special class and were convicted when they both were between, in between jobs and on unemployment. And I know in my own life, Warren and I tried to play these like spiritual gymnastics um, that 
well, week both, we got married, we came out of seminary, and this is in 99, I know I'm old, and this is in 99, and we came out with uh, basically about $150,000 of student debt combined to get us through graduate school. And um, what we made back, you know, back in 99, what you made was <laughs> pennies. And so we played these spiritual gymnastics with ourselves for about three years. Well, and, and maybe you can relate. Like, I don't tithe, even as a pastor, because I have all this student loan debt, and I did that for God, right? And, and finally, about three years into being pastors, I was like, when we were doing those mental gymnastics, we knew, like, we knew we weren't being faithful of what we were called to. And so about three years in, we said, this is it. We can't do it anymore. And we started tithing and have never wanted. I mean, we want, but we've never needed. That's how God works. It's about the first fruit going out, not the bottom line or the net or the gross. It's about trusting that God's got this. So um, for us, there in your worship handout is a chart. It's going to be on the screen. There we go. And this is how the tithe works. 10%, right? You move the decimal point. And so this represents who you are up here. And so figure out... What do you make monthly and move the decimal point? And where are you then on this chart? Because this giving is a spiritual discipline. It's one of the disciplines that we have, just like prayer is a discipline, Meeting with other Christians, worship is a discipline, daily scripture reading, spending time with God, those are spiritual disciplines. And so is generosity and giving. I tithe and give 10% because it's like one of the few I got. I know that I'm going to fail on praying or daily scripture or time with God or serving beyond my job. Like, but I tithe because it's the spiritual discipline that I have. And um, since we decided to do it, I had this conversation with my mom after, who's also a retired pastor, and um, she said, you make it sound so easy. For us, it was. It was a big fear when we stepped up to tithing. But then it was like, well, we just do this now. Back in the day, I would actually, um, uh, at the end of December, write out all my checks uh, for the first of the month, and um, I, I did the bills, and Warren was a pastor as well, so we had to give to two churches. That math was like, okay, split it up. All right, what do you, move it. And so I'd write the checks and I'd give it to my financial secretary uh, in charge. I was like, could you just put this in every month for me? Because I knew where he'd count. I'm like, could you just put them near where you, the counters count the money? But now I e-give, and there are yellow sheets in your pew for those if you want to automate. I automate it. Because for me, then it comes off the top, and it's, it's done. And my mom was like, you made it sound too easy, Jennifer. It was a discipline. It was not easy when we were on unemployment, when we had to write those checks every week. And for some, it is. It's harder, it's, it's harder than that. I also know some people have to still bring the checks. And at one church, I had people not too long ago bring the cash every week because of their discipline. But I automated mine because the, for us, it's that discipline in action. And so it comes down again. How has Jesus 
changed your life. And then, how does Jesus want to continue to change your life to change the lives of others?